Hello everybody and a big welcome to Talking Footy. Our guest tonight, Kevin Sheedy, the legend from Essendon. And as always, Robert Walls and Caroline Wilson. Boy, what a weekend it's been both on and off the field. Wolvesy, to you first, how did you find the long Easter weekend? Saw plenty of football, Bruce. Four games, in fact, and uh, I think the most exciting thing was seeing Collingwood play the best brand of football I've seen in years. Well, those Magpie supporters will be happy about all of that. Caroline, there are a couple of big stories happening right at the moment. Uh, firstly, David Swartz and also Justin Murphy with the racial vilification. What's the latest on that? Well, David Schwartz has been investigated today by Rick Lewis, Bruce, and good evening, Robert. Hi, Carol. Um, I, I, I believe that this will go to mediation. I think that uh, Rick Lewis will take his findings. He's sp speaking to both players and other players who saw the incident. He's had a big day, Schwartz, hasn't he? He's played a wonderful game. He's with Ben Graham now, ironically, isn't he, who he had a lot to say about afterwards. I haven't seen this vision before, but he talks to Murphy there, and obviously there's some response. In fact, he's now pointing the finger to the Woodsy umpire, I think. Yeah, look, and, and he's come off the ground, and we now know that he's allegedly... Justin Murphy is alleging that he has called him a coconut, which means he is a, a black man on the outside and a white man mm. on the inside, which is a grave insult to a player such as Justin Murphy. This, has, this comment has been used in, on the footy field before. There's a growing belief, I think, that this should not go to mediation, that if David Schwartz has done what is alleged, he should go to the tribunal. He's also had a go at his coach. He's also talked about retiring, and he's had a go at the opposition mm. captain. So, OK. Big mouth, David Schwartz. He's on a bit of a high, though, Caro. He won the game over there in Adelaide a week ago, and he played pretty well yesterday. Played played a fantastic game of footy. Maybe he should have left the talking to the footy field, That's Robert. Right. Last week's story con continues to be this week's story. Clinton Casey, the president of Richmond, and David Smorgan, the president of the Western Bulldogs. Have they made up? Has there been any conversation between the two of them today? Amazing that we're still talking about this, yeah. isn't it, Bruce? Uh, they, they spoke a couple of hours ago, in fact. Uh, Clinton Casey is back in Queensland on holidays. He called David Smorgan, who did take his call. There was a suggestion that the Bulldogs president mightn't take the call. They spoke for 45 minutes. There, there will now be correspondence by mail between the two men. And they're even talking about a joint press conference later oh, really? in the week. Do you think sometimes presidents get a bit carried away with themselves? <laughs> Carol, do you think uh, Clinton Casey should have opened up as he did on Saturday? Look, he, he certainly opened up an issue that was almost dead, yeah. didn't he? Now, there is no doubt he's inflamed it. He passionately believes Richmond ended the week on a low and the Bulldogs on a high. He passionately believes that he has flown the flag for Richmond supporters. Richmond supporters, a lot of them, love what Clinton Casey did. Mm. The AFL, on the other hand, is not so sure. And in fact, I think the AFL, at uh, several key executives, Bruce, are at home tonight before they watch Talking Footy, they've already watched a video of Clinton Casey's presidential mm. speech and both he and Danny Frawley, I think Danny Frawley might still get a fine mm. too for his actions. So even the presidents could get done on trial by video. <laughs> <laughs> the mind boggles. Mm. What about the tribunal? Um, the results tonight, Matthew Lord one week and Gary Moorcroft, so not a good result for the Bombers. They play top of the table Sydney in Sydney on Friday night. Lloyd, uh, interesting one, wasn't it? I mean, we'd seen him be pretty aggressive all year, haven't we, Wolsey? Well, I think he's certainly made a uh, statement this year. He, he's bulked up, he's bigger, he's stronger, and he's coming into his absolute prime as a footballer. And I think he's making a statement that uh, I'm not going to be knocked around. He got the week for that, and uh, I, I think he should be satisfied with that. OK, you don't think there should be any appeal. Now, there's an interesting sidelight to that. As you know, that Mark McCurry was the man who was reporting. Now, Brian Sheen, over 300 games experience, Calls over to Corin Rowe, who's only Corin Rowe's only had about 30 games, and you, obviously there's some collusion going on here. So, you know, just who did this to Michael Mansfield? Let's go and find out. You can only surmise that uh, umpire Rowe said to umpire Sheen it was Mark McCurry who is flabbergasted, and why not? It is just amazing vision because uh, you can see Mark McCurry, he throws his arms out and he says, You're kidding, it, it wasn't me. And uh, it was obviously a mistake, mm. but a costly mistake, because Mark McCurry didn't play particularly well after that. And I think if we go back to yesterday, Justin Murphy, after what was said to him, mm. he didn't get a kick. And sometimes it can throw players, because it, it's a pretty traumatic experience they go through. If Matthew Lloyd should be satisfied with Wayne Kerry, would he be satisfied tonight too? Because he didn't even have to front the tribunal. No, he didn't. And you see Wayne coming from behind there, and it's his old foe, Dunkley, and he misses that one, and then he has a second go, and Dunkley plays it up, of course. 
I think in Wayne's favour, the umpire was pretty close to it. And we'll see the umpire coming into the picture there. The umpire did give a 50 metre penalty, so he thought it was uh, a little bit unnecessary, but not enough to report. Mm. Gee, Sydney absolutely bolted in the end. In fact, the disappointing thing from uh, Dennis Fagan's point of view and the Kangaroos was just how easy it got in the last quarter. They got 10 goal to one last quarter. It was a stroll in the park in the end. Well, in the end it was, and uh, the poor old Kangas are a bit dispirited at the moment. At the same time, how good is Sydney? And uh, I guess we'll find out Friday night. Yeah, we will. Uh, having to play that home game, their home game in Sydney against the Swans. And look at their record. They've been beaten by the largest margin in each of the three games so far this year. They didn't finish last year off too well, as we know. It's a damning statistic. Five goals in their last quarters this year against 22. If it was any other club, Robert, we'd be talking about talking them down now. But I think because of North's fantastic past eight years have given us, yeah. we're, just, we're all waiting for another week or two, don't you too think? Too early to tell. Respect to their senior players is so strong. They, evidently, uh, the Kangaroos gained $170,000 to play mm. a home game up there in mm. Sydney, and you just wonder whether it's worthwhile because uh, I'm sure they'd rather play Sydney down here on the MCG on a Friday night. We've got some great vision with the Kangaroos later in the program about what happened at Arden Street tonight, so stay tuned because Dennis Pagan, I think, is trying every trick in the trade. What about Collingwood? Uh, is this the real deal? Can they do something with this start? Two big wins? Well, they won five on the trot last year, but I, I think they're better than they were last year. No doubt they're better. They've got quite a few imports, players like Rintoul and Clement, uh, Malloy, there's quite a few of them and uh, they are playing good football and just terrific to see Anthony Rocker come back. He was dropped last week, had a turn in the ruck and I think that really freed him up and uh, he enjoyed himself and you put Anthony Rocker in form in the forward line alongside the blokes like Malloy and Tarrant, Josh Fraser who's mm -hmm. spending a lot of time up there and they're going to worry most teams. Well, they're going to get tested quickly because they've got Richmond this week and then they've got the Bombers and then they've got another very good team as well. So it'll happen pretty quickly in the next three weeks. Stay there, don't go away. Kevin Sheedy will join us on Talking Footy right after this break. Back to Talking Footy. Without doubt, one of the major talking points of the last week has been the bitter feud between two of the game's legitimate legends, Robert Walls and Kevin Sheedy. Last Monday, Robert wrote an article about Tony Liberatore, which caused great debate in the broader football community. At a press conference to promote the Round 3 clash between Carlton and Essendon, bomber coach Kevin Sheedy had this to say. Sometimes a lot of people are very righteous. I mean, there are a lot of snipers out there in the 1970s and 80s, and all of a sudden now they're, now they're trying to say, I mean, you know, um, let's clean the game up. And some of those blokes are now writing articles and making comments. I said, Felt like saying the other you know, weekend, I said all snipers weren't in Vietnam in the 70s. Well, the common belief was that Kevin Sheedy was referring indirectly to Robert Walls with his comments about snipers. When Robert had this put to him last Tuesday night on Talking Footy, this is what he had to say. I reckon it might have been <laughs> me. Name names, though, couldn't be. But if it was me, he should have had the courage to say so. Well, the feud simmered throughout the week. Robert, in Wednesday's Age, wrote a column naming the most overrated player on each club's list. Stephen Alessio was the bomber mentioned. This clearly irked Kevin Sheedy. Robert followed up on Saturday with glowing praise for Wayne Britton's coaching in Carlton's upset win over Essendon, highlighting Britton's capacity to keep his eye on the ball, something which again seemed to annoy Kevin Sheedy. And by Saturday, it had reached boiling point, as we all found out on Melbourne radio station 3AW. I'll talk to you about plumbers and teachers on Tuesday night. Well, 65% winning ratio to compare to your middle 30s. Good luck to you. Doesn't worry me. I tell you what, I'll talk to you about that on Tuesday night well, too. Well, you, maybe, you, maybe you went to Brisbane and hit, pal. See you later. Kevin, welcome. Uh, welcome Gee, to the program. This is a pretty tight session, wasn't it? <laughs> How do you feel about it now? I mean, you were obviously pretty upset on, uh, on Saturday. Oh, look, I've been probably upset a fair while about... Uh, Robert and some of the things he said at a coaching conference uh, early this year and uh, probably it's the first time I've spoken to him, so I let him have it. That, that conference uh, was written this morning, Caroline Wilson's article, was that, was that an ac absolutely accurate article from your point of view? Well, I'd have to say the person I spoke to uh, that was at the conference said um, to me that Robert was, a re was fairly, well, I'd have to say that, not a really good coach, overrated coach, those sorts of comments and it went further and further. And I thought to myself, well, gee whiz, if that's what a coaching conference is about, then uh, look out when I get my first chance. Let me say here, I spoke <coughs> at that coaches conference, I never said you were overrated. And you can talk to Alan Jeans about that because he was at my side. What I did say was that 
whilst you've coached 20 years, it's narrow experience because you've only ever coached at the one team. I was talking to a group of 30 players who were all around the 29, 30 age mark, all looking to coach in the future. And I was talking to them about the pitfalls of going to clubs where you didn't get much support. And some of those players will take on those jobs because they'll be desperate to do it. And I've had the experience of being at bottom of the ladder clubs. Twice I took on wooden spoon teams. And I also know what it's like to coach at a team that gives you every support. And what I said was, you've been at the one club for 20 years, at a club that's given you every support. I didn't say you're overrated. And as I said, Alan Jeans was there. Well, you ask Alan. You have only got to interview probably the next 30 uh, guys are going out, prospective coaches. And um, from my point of view, uh, I wasn't too pleased with it. And uh, and um, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll trust the people that I spoke to as far as that. And uh, look, coaching's not easy. It doesn't matter whether you stay in a club for 20 years. It is a very, very hard journey to stay in a club 20 years. And, no you know, doubt I, about that. You know, very, very difficult. And I know that going to, to Brisbane is very, very difficult too, particularly where you ended up in, in the Gold Coast. But, you know, when, uh, when the rules change between VFL to AFL, um, we were at least the one club, Essendon, that gave Brisbane seven players, of which at least four or five are fairly good players. At each time, yourself asked for myself or the team to come up and play in Cairns or Maroochydore. We were the only ones probably that went. I remember distinctly the Cairns game. So I thought that, you know, there's a lot of aspects to coaching other than just winning a game of footy. And, and that's probably where I'm coming from in regard to our club has gone all over Australia to support footy. And as a coach, you've got to convince your board whether you, you should do it. Now, when that comes back at a seminar and you're there to promote coaching and hopefully these guys are going to be great coaches, uh, when I heard what I heard, I'm, I was pretty savage, mm. I'll be honest. Well, you say there have been two jobs, in my opinion, in the last 20 years where a coach gets every support, and that's been at Carlton. And I had that job for four years, so I know what it's like to be able to drive in the, in the driver's seat of a Rolls Royce, as you've done. I think you've been a good coach, let me say that from the start. But you have no idea what it's like to take on a wooden spoon team. And for you to say that he went to Brisbane and hid, that's offensive and insulting. Well, it can be offensive. Let me tell you, you wouldn't know what it was like to have an owner of a club who wanted to close it down every second week. You wouldn't know what it was like to have 90% of your players who come from outside that state are homesick, don't get opportunities because no one's interested in Aussie rules up there. You wouldn't know what it was like to go to your own bank and pull money out to pay your best and fairest winner because the club couldn't afford it. So you don't know really, you haven't got a broad experience of coaching. You've been at the one club for 20 years. Malthouse has got a broad experience because he's coached the Bulldogs for six years. Middle of the road battling club when he was there. Where he then took on Robert, the West Coast Eagles and, were at the start of the and then he took on Collingwood. So he's seen football from three different clubs and three different angles. All I'm saying where did is that Essendon you haven't were seen at the start anything the but 80s. one view, which is a pretty well, good one. The, the, where, did you, where did you think Essendon were at the start of the 80s? They had not won a final. They hadn't beaten Carlton for a decade. They wouldn't know and didn't know at one stage what it was like to win a final for something like 13 or 14 years. We cleared 70% of the list by the time we won the 84 Premiership. So every coaching job has a difficulty. I think the, That's surpri all I'm I think the surprising thing for an outsider is Every that coaching job has a difficulty. You both seem to have been very successful. I mean, Kevin is a legendary coach from an outsider's point of view, who's won four Premierships and has been at the club for 21 years now, which I think is a very valued thing. And Robert, you've taken on four clubs. You've took Fitzroy from bottom to the finals. You were in two consecutive grand finals at Carlton. And we're also very successful in getting Brisbane into its first finals. From an outsider's point of view, it's surprising <coughs> this argument because we, we would think that you've both been very successful in your own way. Kevin continuing to be, and you now in a very different role. It depends how you view success as a coach. And I guess that's one of the things that, you know, I, I pumped at that coaching conference because in the time that I was at Brisbane, the percentages were way down, but that didn't matter because what you were doing was building something so that it could go on. In many ways, I regard my time at Brisbane as being more successful than when I coached Carlton mm. with players that 
you could bring in from outside, which you could do in the 80s, you could buy them. Um, and Carlton and Essendon could buy them. I feel I have to go into the past, and I don't really want to, but uh, we've all read Mike Sheehan's articles, and we read Caroline today, which was you've talked about already. You, between you, won six premierships in seven years between 1968 and 74. Kevin three with Richmond, you three with Carlton. You were at each other's throats. I mean, is there something from those playing days that is still simmering here? Oh, between well, not the two from of my you? point of view. Personally, I'm not from my point of view. I, I mean, we, we enjoyed the competitiveness of each other um, and both sides, but, you know, I thought that um, when you go to talk at a coaching seminar, you should be totally positive all the way through. Yeah. Because well, you're developing Kevin, the Kevin, we find coaching. it hard to believe that the coaching seminar, and I know you've, you've said this, that, that what Robert allegedly said oh, about well, you I mean, and his coaching seminar. I mean, that's on one or two other things, but I mean, I, mean, I didn't appreciate Robert's burst on Dennis Pagan, who's never missed the finals before. And here I am going to finally, gee whiz, you know, finally got back in the finals ourselves, and here's poor Dennis copping. And what didn't you like about the Dennis well, Pagan story? Well, I would re think, because I would think that it's proven to be correct. We actually mentioned that North should, re well, Gee, well, this is a hard call. The guy's given everything, the players. Of course he has. I think Dennis Pagan has been a wonderful coach. But I reckon Dennis, and this was what my article about, Dennis needed to change his ways. He had an ageing group of stars. He spelled them over summer. He got rid of some assistant coaches and brought in fresh voices. He's recruited young for the first time in a long time. But this Those things have all happened over the last six or seven months. This is exactly the same thing that happened to me after seven or eight years at Essendon. And we've been able to get back up there and get into another three or four grand finals and two preliminary finals where you get beaten by a point more. But, you know, you're up in that top three or four on another six or five or six occasions, whatever. It's very, very hard calling, Dennis. Kevin, we, in the media... Hard to be and, successful. No doubt. In the media and as football enthusiasts, we find Robert Wall's articles refreshing, enlightening, illuminating. I, I get the feeling that you're objecting to the fact that he's been in the inner sanctum, like you are now as a coach, and is telling us the things that you probably don't want us to know about. No, no, that's not, that's not right at all. I just think that he's a very critical person. I don't think he writes enough positive articles. And probably I'm a, a more positive person. I try never to write like that. I mean, I know he's a journalist now. And, Kevin, and, in uh, the last week, the, you, were, you were the, I reckon, the official and the unofficial ambassador for the game of football in Australia. And yet we had... I really felt it was unedifying to hear you having to flaunt your record. Well, on, I mean, Dennis said the same thing last year too, don't forget, that um, I'll, we'll, I'll retire with my record. I mean, sometimes that happens. I mean, a lot of people think out there that whatever Robert says is the absolute, that's it in coaching. Robert Walls and myself are very different personalities, okay? And we coach differently and we think about football differently. And a lot of people in the press don't look at that. So. You know, you've have, you have an opinion, and that's great. But when you really understand the different personalities and the different styles of coaches out there, and Robert, Robert has done well as a coach, and so have I, but it's not the only way. And when I read and when I listen, and he does write some great articles, and he does make some terrific comments now on the television, but it's still just that one way. And I think there's another group of coaches out there that perhaps don't coach like Robert, and I'm one of them. Would you agree that you've behaved in a rather irrational manner over I the think last we both week. have, because I still think that Robert shouldn't have said what he said at the coaching seminar. And what, is, what has your club said to you over the last few days? Would they rather you just... Well, stop? no, I think they'll just, just make sure that you simmer it down and let's get on with the job of coaching, which is what we've got to do. But I still don't think that really when it's all said and done, uh, that there are a lot of different styles and of there, coaching. There was no there. animosity between no. you two from your playing well, Not at all. Did well, you know each other so socially then? Did you... Oh, we, we knew each other. Look, I've got no problem with the playing days. No. And Kevin, Kevin would be amazed, actually, at the similarities of our backgrounds. Because um, you talk about the, the Paran days and the streets and all of that sort of stuff. I was doing the same thing in Brunswick at the is same time. Is this plumbers and teachers, is it? Well, well they're different personalities, different styles. We, mm. we've I don't pretty much to be taught and told by you know, people out there that are very structural in regard to the process of how to play a game of footy, how to run a game of footy. I mean, you know, there are strengths on either side of different types of coaches, where we're coming from. Mm. And one of mine is, happens to be getting good players. Kevin, one of the things I find hard to understand is that why didn't you ring Robert Walls up after that, press, after that coaches' conference privately and say to him, well, Walsey, we've got a problem, let's go and have a coffee and sort it out. 
Well, why should I have to ring Robert Walls up every time I got a problem with him? Well, that seems to be Gee, the big I'll problem. I'll be ringing you up every week. <laughs> it's better than going on television and calling him a sniper, isn't it? Uh, oh, well, I never said that. See, be very careful about that. Because, you Kevin, know, that's a very everybody difficult... Everybody who well, heard that comment I mean, that's a typical... believed you, you... You weren't referring to Robert Walls? No. No, that's the Herald Sun writing exactly about age writers. And I thought you would have known that. Who were you inferring <laughs> was a sniper? All the articles, all the comments by all the players in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Which covers None a hell of a lot of people. None of them are right. Kevin, you can't back Comments. away from you can't Comments. back away from the fact that you were talking about Robert Walls. Well, you you must have been thinking, were you? <laughs> Everybody knew you were well, talking about. Well, I Robert. never named Robert Walls. He just jumped on it. I mean, that's. <laughs> what a, um, I don't know any other player from the seventies and eighties who was writing articles Kevin, about Tony Lebrun. What a terrible Lebrun mistake, mistake to do. Do you think? Don't don't no. talk in riddles. <laughs> Answer the question. And the question is, Robert, I never mentioned I, your name. Was I a sniper? All the seventies and eighties. That people out there making the comments. And if and if I uh, said on the radio, if the hat fits, then we all. I think it. it's and I wrote about sad. myself. It's just a bit sad that you go so far with your bluff, and when your bluff's called, you back off. Well, in what way? Well, yeah. well, you just won't name me. Well, and well I don't, why should I? Don't I don't mind if you name me. To tell you the truth, it doesn't worry me. The one thing I would say, and I hope I don't know whether you think this way or not. We both played in a pretty tough era with good teams and uh, pretty solid expectations from most of us. Now, we did things in those days, 60s and 70s, that wouldn't stand up today. Well, I look back on it now, <coughs> and it's not something I'm not particularly proud of some of Absolutely. the things that I did. And I would like to think that our sons and our grandsons can play on a, on a safer field than we did. I think that's, that's important. Um, so that's how I see it. Look, mm. we did things because that was the expectation then, but for goodness sake, we've gone on a third of a century since then. Yeah, well, we all, look, we all coach differently. Sheets, you know? were you Toey coming in tonight? I felt I was coming into a tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> and I got one, I had one of them last year. But um, <laughs> look, to be quite honest, uh, at least I put it on the table, at least I, I spoke to him on the radio, and that's what I felt. Now, mm. what jumped out, jumped out, and I've, 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 I've been holding that inside, but... Uh, you know, Robert's got uh, footy every week. He's had four matches this weekend. He's got the radio, he's got, he's got the microphone, he's got the pen. And we only have a comment every probably three minutes, four minutes, twice a week. You've got your own column sheets. In this well, but I don't write negative. Well, maybe, maybe Robert, very maybe you're, you're rattled by the fact that he's a bit more accurate than uh, some... That? Robert. In what, in what way? Well, I mean, maybe the fact that, as, as Bruce said earlier, Robert's come out of one world and into another and he's writing about the game in a more honest... Honest? And you're saying coaches are dishonest? Well, he's in, well he are, are you? sometimes after games, certainly. In a more honest and occasionally brutal, occasionally glowing fashion than any, I mean, than any other... It's not an easy game. ...former coach player has before. Coaching's not easy. It's not, look, it's not an easy game. Exactly. Uh, well, and last yeah, week, coach. in the days leading up to a very big game for you, did you take your eye off the ball? Well, I don't think I did because I made three comments, which took about a minute each. Kevin... Whoever minutes. you were referring to about the Liberatore Knights article, the article that I wrote, you obviously were not happy with it. Um, and I was unhappy about a behind-the-play incident. Mm. You yourself were unhappy about a behind-the-play incident last year. That's right. And you made your thoughts well-known when Absolutely. you came on the field. Absolutely, because I saw the player, I was standing right next to him, the doctor said, with 90 seconds to go before the siren, I think he's got a busted cheekbone and he cannot see out of one eye. Now, that's the doctor telling me then the siren goes. So, you know, mm. very, very difficult position to be in, isn't it? When well, one, one of your players are there. Oh, I understand See, that, but you don't like somebody else prepared to write about a behind the play incident, but you're happy to jump out and give your defend. thoughts. Yeah, mm. defend my player. Absolutely. So you, could you could understand what Danny Frawley did with, um, with Knights. Oh, I could, mm. quite easily. Is there anything you regret, Sheets? I get the feeling you wish you hadn't gone on AW now. Oh, that was probably half, fairly harsh on Robert, yep. I'd say, yeah. But, I mean, look, Robert said, yep. you know, Robert's been out there and, uh, you know, he's, he's coached and he knows how hard it is and he's had his training drills. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll, something will jump up in the next week or two and it'll bite us all on the bum and all of a sudden you wish it hadn't happened. Mm. Three-quarter time... And Kevin, it will happen. Kevin, you led by 11 points at three-quarter time. Mm. The game was up for grabs. It was tight, wasn't it? It was interesting you took charge of the coaching at three-quarter time. You, none of the assistants... God, you, see, you were very animated, and you could see that you were... Most coaches are three quarters, don't they? Well... Not, well, not everyone, but I'd say most. I haven't seen you like this for a little while. Well, it's only three weeks into this season. <laughs> but, you know, we're, like, we're ahead of all the changes, and only just. I mean, 
Everybody talked Did about flooding, and yet we were the ones that were doing the flooding in the first quarter. But no one back, understood that. Going back to Caroline's question, did the whole week, was it a burden for you on Thursday night at all, the rest of the week? No. 21 not, years. Not at all? No. Well, I just you carried none of that with you into that game? No, you don't. I mean, the hardest part, in the, really, in the end was, to be quite honest, is Carlton made three changes a half hour before the game. Mm. And that was very difficult to coach with. Mm. I think you were distracted. I think you were distracted in the days leading up to the Caroline, game. Caroline, you I... wouldn't know. Well, Kevin, yes. I know that you were very, very upset yeah. about Robert and that you have been for some time. And I don't believe that three comments over three minutes were the amount of time you spent stewing over Robert Walls last week. Oh, I think that um, you have three changes a half hour before the game and they're very, very good players. It's I'm not very suggesting difficult. that's why you were beaten, by the way. Mm. I'm just mm. letting you know that it's very difficult. You've never coached and you've got to understand that. Where do we go from here? In, I mean, this is personal, I know, but in the relationship between the two of you, I mean... Oh, I think we're probably like two, um, two guys with a hose over the fence. Just <laughs> wearing each other. Yeah, I, 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 I thought it would be played tonight. Well, I, was, I thought it would be fantastic just to see... We, a lot of the old we, showgirl in Sheen, We actually <laughs> used to be neighbours for 20 years. <laughs> just pour the hose over the how, fence. How cl were you in the same street? Same suburb. Same suburb. Who shifted? I did. Good you idea. Couldn't. I had to get out. <laughs> there wasn't a sort of renovation. It wasn't big enough for two of us. No. A good idea. No. I think Shimmerbush lived around the corner and Denshi and mm. the other boys. Have you ever done, have you ever had a drink? No. Well, I don't think so. You've had a cup of tea. You came oh, around, come around, you came around and asked me a few ideas. Yeah. Mm. About Roddy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So uh, we want, start want, again, and no, um, I sort of want to keep going. I want to talk about the game slightly, but I feel well, like we think we should, should we? I mean, we've had ours. Well, that, okay. Well, we'll, we'll now. Want to get on with life? I'm quite happy with that, but you wouldn't you know. shake hands and make up. We, we just did before the show. Oh, did you? I didn't, I didn't see. I know. See, so you don't see everything. <laughs> That's for sure. Kevin, have, Kevin, have a cup of tea with him now, Robert. I'll have a cup of tea with anyone, <laughs> Kevin. You've lost four out of six if you count Ansett Cup. Oh, now, last year you won every Bell side in Yeah, I know, but but. You have lost four out of six. Are there areas of concern? Look, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that we could be playing better. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And I think that um, even though we've kicked 23 goals in the first two matches, but, you know, really last week was a disappointing loss for us. And um, we've had a, had a really good sit down and think about... I mean, and we'll, we'll lose Miss City and it'll be a big loss. We'll lose Lordy for a week but mm. uh, and Gary Moorcroft. But, I mean, we're just going to make sure that we play smarter football. She, she's, this is and we weren't very smart yeah. last Thursday. Sorry to interrupt, but this is Joe Mercedes before half-time. Now, he looked pretty sore and injured. He came back on after half-time. What happened at half-time in the rooms? Did you feel as if he had run his race at that stage? Well, well look, I mean, in the end, he, he, he's, uh, we think that um, after a while, he, he's went from a cork leg to a knee. Right. And then the knee's the one. So, so retrospectively, putting him back on after half-time? Well, it would have been, yeah. No yeah. doubt about that. But, I mean, that's a decision I don't make. Right. The advice was to you that he well, come I mean, back. as far as well, he that's what he thought it was. Yeah. I mean, he can only relay that to the doctor, yep. and the doctor said, "Look, go out and try him and see how it is, and if not, you can take him off." Yeah. Look, let's leave it there for the moment. There's a lot more to talk about, um, so stay tuned, including that North Melbourne vision coming up from Arden Street. More after this. Mm. We're talking free. Welcome back to Talking Footy. It has been an eventful week for Kevin Sheedy. They lost for only the fourth time in 44 weeks on Thursday night. And with uh, three, in fact, four top-class Carlton players out, they were overwhelming favourites. We talked about Camparelli. In fact, Robert made the call that he's gone from a very good player, Sheeds, to a champion player. I mean, he and Ratton were just decisive, weren't they, in Carlton's win? Well, they were. We, look, we tried uh, young Mark McVay. And, I mean, look, we, we're just trying to look at, for new players to come into certain areas with since Buick and Denham and these sort of boys have gone. So um, he never played on a champion, but I think he really has lifted. I think he's a very exciting player. Uh, I think we have a look at that vision there, and uh, he's pretty happy about the way that he's played, because I, I just get a feeling that uh, Scott Camperali, uh, he'd be one that you would have gone after in recent years, Kevin, as far as making, making it hard for him. And I think he saw that as a real triumph night for himself because well, he just ran and ran and ran and finished so well. But he can run. I mean, he's just such a magnificent athlete. You know, mm. he's got better and he, he's got a kick in his, his gait, you know, his speed and he kicks in so he gets around the, the guy, he kicks it to him and cuts back across the other way and transfer play out. And I, look, it was a really good lesson for Mark Levay because he's really come on for us. Mm. And he, we think we've got a player there and, and, you know, you get a player out of Gosford 
you know, it's pretty good. Mm. You know, if he plays under games at Essendon wearing number 10 plus, well, we're very, we're really happy with that kid. Kevin, it seemed last year that everybody was playing well. You didn't have any weaknesses. Now, you obviously know it better than us, but this year you've got injuries. Now, Gary Moorcroft is struggling. He is really struggling to get a kick, let alone kick a goal. Uh, look, I think it's a frustration sitting on the bench, I'll be honest. I mean, look, he's, he really needs ground time. And I mean, what do you do if you get to a situation... Uh, he's got a week tonight, hasn't he? Yeah. He's, he's got, got a week tonight. And then... She's no goals in his last five games. Total kicks this year, it's six. Well, look... Would he have been dropped this week, do you think? Uh, had he not got a match? Well, well, we've got two games. We, well, I mean, we play tomorrow week, mm. Wednesday, on, you know, Anzac Day. So mm. we've got two matches in the next mm. seven days, sort of thing. Mm. So um, he'll be back in probably nearly for the Anzac Day, <laughs> with a rest. You talked Tim Watson into coming back. Do you think Ken Judge should talk Guy McKenna into coming back? Gee whiz, uh, Tim Watson, I don't know Guy McKenna. 31 he is. Yeah, oh, well, Played no, nine I, games last year. Age isn't a worry. Okay. Not a worry when you look at um, Bradley. He's just an absolute says seagulls there. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's quite amazing that, um, that what Watson was able to do. To come back and play in a premiership was a pretty exciting sort of period for our club. And I personally think it really set the place mm. up. Again. You still haven't answered the question, McKenna. Well, I don't know his problems. Okay. It, but it, it's, it's, all, it's, back, it's I mean. well, I mean, it's up to Guy and the, and the medicos and, and whether Ken would want to. What, what do you think, Ron? It surprises me that he wants to come back because we, you saw that hit on him before. Earl Sporting almost killed him. At 31, back injuries, he's got a role as an assistant coach with the Eagles. I, I just would have thought, well, do that. Do the apprenticeship as a coach because there's a lot more to life than being out on the field. And plus, he's... he's Two premierships, so mm. best and fairest. He's done I, it all. Mm. Look, I mean, I've had a better time than not playing. I've had 500 games, and mm. only, I mean, it's been better afterwards. I think you've had a good time both playing and not no, playing. No one has ever said that before to no. me. No footballer has ever said to me that they enjoyed coaching more than playing. Well, I mean, you don't expect to have that long a coaching career, so it's nearly double your playing careers. So. Mm. I mean, I love playing, but your coaching's fantastic. Yeah. I, I interviewed Bobby Charlton once, and he said, just before the World Cup, and he said, you know the one thing I miss? I still can't play. I wish I could. I mm. dream about it all the time. So mm. it is interesting. Well, there's that many better players out there now than when you played that it's embarrassing when you look at your own videos. A, God. A, a taxi driver said to me a week ago, what, what's Sheedy doing, taking James Hurd off at three-quarter time and costing him Brownlow medal votes, like you did against Port Adelaide? But what about Nathan Buckley? Surely, I mean, he's got two bests on ground so far, or has he? I mean, do you, do you think this sort of reaction to umpires does cost a bloke Brownlow medal votes? Oh, she was what she said. As long as he's talking nice, it won't. I don't think they like it. And I think, uh, well, it depends on the personalities of the umpires. And, and that's just the, the population at large. But there'd, there'd be half of them who'd say, well, there's only one way I can fix you. Mm. And I, I think that if it's a line ball, they'd go against him. Well, I mean, the old-fashioned umpire wouldn't even worry about it. Brophy and uh, mm. these guys, um, even Billy Dallow, I mean, they're, 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 we just, they were different sorts. I mean, we're different times, aren't we? Do you think the umpires are too touchy? There was an incident on the weekend, and we think Peter Matera got 50 for talking to the umpire in the way that he did. We, Daniel Kerr, we're not sure if the ball did get back to Hamill on the fall or to, or to Lawrence, but look at Matera here, and there's a 50 metres coming. Do you think the umpires are a bit touchy, Shep? Um Look, I, I don't know. I can't comment, honestly, can I? I mean, I'm getting in trouble, so... But footy's change. I think Peter Matera got 50 metres for uh, verbalising to the umpire. And I reckon that's a little bit disappointing because he fr free kick against him, he was a bit frustrated. He didn't show the world, he didn't show the crowd. It was just between the player and the umpire. And on Peter Matera, let me say, I saw him play his best game of football, I reckon, for five years mm. at Colonial the other day. He was just sensational. That's a worry. We've got him in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Does, do you still, Wanganin, you'd still like to have him at Windy Hill? Well, I mean, look, every time a new franchise jumped up, uh, we lost a great player. You didn't get anything for him, did you? Oh, uh, we got did a... You? Well, I thought at the time that the draft and trading rules were wrong. I asked for our club to ask for an ombudsman because Wanganin was the best player going to Port Power, so we believe we should have got the first draft choice. But we didn't. He was I thought a, that was wrong. He was a forward when he came to you, wasn't he? And, and yeah. He became a great defender. Well, he was a forward who couldn't get a kick. Now he's a forward who can actually change a game. But, uh, look, you know, in fairness to the, the, the assistant coach, so that, uh, I think it might have been David Whedon, mm. said, look, just threw up a comment one day and as you're doing coaching meetings, throw him down the back and see what he's like down there or on the brown line. I reckon it's good that he's gone forward now. Because, oh, yes. uh, Absolutely. For him to kick six goals, Very Port exciting. Adelaide kick 23. And we were talking on the weekend, uh, who's the best forward pocket or, or medium-sized player inside the forward 50? Ronnie Burns, Jeff Farmer or Gavin Wanganeen? 
and we're lucky that we've got three wonderful players to choose from. And if I had to pick one, I think I'd go Wanganui. Mm. You could go a lock on too, couldn't you? Look. Yeah. We talked about uh, Dennis Pagan, and we've talked about him already tonight. Uh, tonight at Arden Street, they've had an inter intra club trial match. Wayne Carey didn't play, Winston Abraham obviously didn't play, but they, we believe they were at it for two by 20 minute quarters. Yeah, that's right, Bruce. They, um, and yeah, mm. it, was a, it was a tough game. And Dennis Pagan, when asked, what are the medicos saying about this? I mean, you've, he said, look, so some days you've just got to throw science out the window. Kevin, when would be the last time you've had full scale match practice through the week in season? Uh, well, it would depend on the break between the games. So sometimes these days you, you might get a 10 game break, but um, I probably had it twice mm. last year. There are some worrying signs though, aren't there, Bruce? I mean, sausage sizzles and practice games like this. Dennis is trying a lot of different things. Nothing's working. I, I don't know. What's your view of what he did today, Robert? I, I don't mind what he did because I think, I think sometimes our players are wrapped in cotton wool. We, we're too worried about getting them injured on the training track. So sometimes they never do competitive work except in a game. And then if they don't do it in a game, they don't do it at all. So at least on the training track, you can control that they do hit each other. But how remarkable that a, a Gee, you coach... you must have coached. I uh, know, <laughs> oh, it's old-fashioned <laughs> thinking. It's <laughs> old-fashioned, Bruce, but it's, uh, it's OK. I think, you know, I think it's right. I think that sometimes that's absolutely mm. right. And sometimes the players that don't really do much of the hard stuff in a game, mm. well, then you go over there to do so much right. Did they look like they didn't want to play against Sydney, the Kangaroos? Uh, well, I watched the game, and uh, gee, I thought they got out of the box very well. Mm. I mean, they were up right up there at half-time, at every opportunity. I mean, the uh, Swans had a couple of more points on the scoreboard, but um, it was just their last half, really. You keep agreeing with Wolsey. I can feel a cup no, of tea. I can <laughs> feel a cup of tea coming on between you two. You very, can somebody get a hose? <laughs> very, very, very shortly. Look, Troy Wilson, 29 no, years first. of age. We're going to talk about him after this. Stay tuned. Night, <laughs> we're talking guests, along with uh, our regulars, Caroline Wilson and uh, Robert Walsh. We're going back to the Port Adelaide game. There was a some interesting umpiring decisions against Matthew Primus in the first quarter. It became farcical at times. He got uh, he got the rough end of the pineapple, I think, Bruce. Several times he uh, he just put his body. Look here, he just stands his ground, and for some reason he gets a free kick against him. And, and obviously he can't work it out either. It, it is a tough call. He stand, he's a big, strong man, and uh, he's got to be able to do that. There's nothing wrong with what he's doing, and he goes to the umpires, and he can do that as captain and say, "Well, hang on, what's going on?" Do the number of free kicks in Rucking contests worry you at all? Oh, look, there's just a couple of little areas I reckon that we've got to keep looking at the, just to find out what is acceptable and what is not. And, mm. and that's that's one of them. What about the deliberate out of bounds? We're going to show you Bitterscombe on the weekend for Richmond. He wasn't pinged. I reckon this is about as close as you get to one, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it was only a slap, too, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's just one of those guys. I went and saw the Tigers on the weekend. Mm. Had a bit of a look because uh, I just haven't seen a lot of Brisbane. Yep. Wolsey, did you see John Barker um, showing the ball to Lee Brown? Yeah, and uh, John would be disappointed with this. Uh, on reflection, he'd be disappointed. Completely out of character, that is. And uh, he's already mm. uh, admitted that he did the wrong thing and, and regrets it. So, uh, yeah, just in the heat of the battle, those things sometimes come up. But uh, Peter Schwab, as you can imagine, would hate to have seen that. Got two goals. Carol, are you intrigued with Troy oh. Wilson like the rest of us? Oh, look, it, given hope to every mid-twenties to late-twenties <laughs> amateur footballer in Australia, isn't Just it? Just terrific. He's so big across the shoulders. He's so broad. He's played amateur football in Perth till he was 24, 25, and only played about four or five years in the uh, West Australian competition. He took 15 marks in this game. He started on Barry Hall. He went on to uh, Justin Platt, Mark Gale, finished on Aaron Hamill, and he could have kicked 10, Bruce. How tall is he? He'd be 6'2". Six, three. When do you play them, Kevin? Uh, we've got a uh, three week, three matches to them. When does, got... when does Dean Wallace come back? I'm just thinking. <laughs> you know, we might have to... Well, well, a, you want a coach, do you? Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I hate what? to say it, but he looked as though he was playing on a silly urban <laughs> ground then too, didn't he, Troy Wilson? Yeah, Colonial's very... Great effort, but isn't it? Mm. Really. Uh, it's amazing. Are you, are you as surprised as the rest of us with Wilson? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, oh, look, I mean, we, we never had him on our recruiting sheets, so we would be. There's no doubt about that. We, we reckon that we're not bad recruiters at bowling. There might have been the goal of the year and the mark of the year for that game. Mm. I mean, Daniel Kerr, the, the young Aboriginal teenager, took us beauty, didn't he? Just a terrific grab. And have a look at this goal by Mark Miranda, ex-Tiger, 
been out of the game for uh, virtually two years. Paddling that ball, that's a hard one to pick up when it's rolling away from you. He finally gets control, comes back onto the left boot and nails it. Goal of a year to this stage. Tigers wouldn't be happy. Five games in two years for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gee whiz, it's, um, look, sometimes it just happens that you get a person that might get the player right. And uh, I mean, that's what happened with John Quinn with us. Uh, mm. It just, just body, the body mechanic and then mm. got a lot of our guys right. Your fitness man. We'll take a break, Sheets, and uh, Caro and Morsey. We'll be back with more right after this. Tuesday night, we're talking free. Well, I think we've all seen double at times on a footy field, and uh, I reckon we were seeing double on the weekend. Ryan Loney for Collingwood and Nathan Loney for the Box Hill Hawks. Now, they're identical twins. Nathan on the left and Ryan on the right, both letting loose with the left foot, both picked up on the draft. Their dad said the only reason I could tell who was who, I used to call one red and one blue when they were kids. Have a look at that. <laughs> are they terrific? Yeah. The Loney boy, Sheet. Um, but like the Alistair Lord twins, aren't they? Yeah. Like, it's very hard to tell. Mm. The Wakelands, there's always a couple. Mm. I often think that Daryl's playing for Collingwood <laughs> and Shane's out at Port Alley. You never tell, can you? And the blokes over the fence with the... We have tracked it down. There, which one are you, Sheets? Um, <laughs> I reckon... <laughs> Probably a fairly good way to finish it, don't you? No, you shook hands before we went on air. Will you shake hands publicly now? Oh, I've got no problem with that. No, no, that's all right. Oh, jeez. You see that? <laughs> uh, it's good you came on. It's a fabulous Friday this week, isn't it? With Collingwood uh, and Richmond and... Uh, and uh, well, have they gone the right way? Hopefully the Swans fans have missed out a bit, haven't they? You don't get involved in television issues, do you, Shit? No, just some. Mm. It's all footy. Mm. Well, you're on the telly this week, mm. back into Melbourne, and uh, Collingwood and Richmond's on a bit later in the night, but it was a tough call. And we're up to uh, Sydney on Friday, Bruce. With Plugger. Mm. Mm. Plugger. Yeah, doing the call with us. Caroline, thanks very much. Thanks, Terrific. Bruce. Looking forward to Kevin your articles involved. and the ads. You right. too, Wolsey. You'll sleep well tonight, I'm sure. Sheesh, thanks for coming <coughs> in. Oh, are you looking forward to my articles in the Australian? Or, uh... I will, because uh, you're always positive. I haven't forgot that. <laughs> Michael Mansfield, what a night for him and the Blues on Thursday night. See you later. This is one of the same. Well done. Remarkable stuff. Historic, famous, former delight. The Blues have created some history here.